Hi, everybody. I'm Lori Weiss, and I'm the local history librarian here at Saratoga Springs Public Library. And I want to welcome you to our brown bag lunch series. Um, this will be the last of 2020. That's such a nice phrase to say. <laughs> <laughs> the brown bag lunch series has been active since 1995. We do this in partnership with the Saratoga Springs Area Heritage Visitor Center, which at the moment is closed, but their parent organization, Discover Saratoga, still remains active with us. So I'm very glad to be able to bring this to you today. Um, today's program is going to be on the George S. Bolster Photographic Collection, uh, part two. And with us is Jamie Perillo, who is the executive director at the Saratoga Springs History Museum. And Charlie Kunzel, who is a retired teacher here from Saratoga. He's on the board of the History Museum, and he's very active in local history stuff. So um, please, Jamie and Charlie, take it away. Thanks, Lori. Thank you, Lori. Well, um, let me just start by saying that, um, well, many of you have probably seen or listened to both um, myself and Charlie give lectures. And when we were putting this together, we both had our own ideas about how this should be. Because we have our own favorite um, things that we love about Saratoga Springs history. I love the, the history of the Canfield Casino, um, especially since this is the 150th anniversary. Charlie um, loves the Mineral Springs. So the two of us went back and forth about what we were going to do, and neither of us won. So we decided we would split this, um, and we each get to talk about our favorite parts of Saratoga history. So we're going to start with Charlie talking about the Mineral Springs. and. Then from there, I'll, I'll uh, pipe in and talk about um, the history of the casino. And um, we may each um, interject on each other here and there because we both got opinions about some of the things we're going to show. So how about you, Charlie? How about okay. Um, first of all, our first slide that's uh, probably visible, I hope everyone right now, is a picture of uh, George Bolster in his studio years ago, hand coloring some of uh, the pictures in the collection. Upon his death, we eventually um, received um, 325,000 bolster photos or images. And these are extensive histories of the city of Saratoga. So Damien and I are always very excited. And I think other presenters that use parts of our collection are able to use some of these pictures because they really, allow you to step back in time and take a take a look at what was going on in the city as um, not only George Bolzer, but other famous photographers of the day in the 1800s captured um, events and activities that were going on in the Springs at the time. If you, uh, Callie, if you could go to the next slide, please. Hmm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. There we go. Great. Um, if you're going to talk about the springs, at least uh, Dave Patterson and I talked about them for a long time when we had our business, our Saratoga Tours business. Uh, we always felt that you had to start the story out with um, the beginning, and our beginning is at High Rock Park. This um, a woodcut kind of uh, describes an event that occurred in August of 1771. And what's portrayed here is a group of Mohawk, who are the indigenous tribe to this area, carrying one of their trusted um, friends, Sir William Johnson, to the site. Uh, Sir William had been hurt in the Battle of Lake George uh, during the French and Indian War. And as a result, um, a musket ball was never removed from his upper thigh because it was too close to uh, arterial problems that would probably have caused him to bleed to death. So the surgeon stitched it up and left it in. And later in life, he really suffered from this. And there's also other thoughts that maybe it was uh, him suffering from gout and a few other things. But the Mohawk, who had protected the area and visited the uh, High Rock Spring for a very, very long time, actually confided in him, carried him to the spring. He stayed four days, bathed in the water, cleaned out the wound, drank the waters, etc., And then he, as you can see in this image, he's being carried to the site. The um, recollection of this is that he walked most of the way back into the Mohawk Valley upon the four days of uh, 
being the first health resort visitor on record in Saratoga. So that's where it all started was at High Rock. Hey, Kelly, you go to the next one, please. Um, I get criticized for this, especially in my own household. Uh, my undergraduate degree is in geology. So I have a tendency to like too much geology and geology terms. So I'll try to keep this real simple. This is a view of uh, the famed cryptozones uh, that used to make up a, an attraction near Saratoga called the Petrified Sea Gardens. And um, they're very, very rare. Um, they're found in uh, limestone rock. And what that does is they're fossilized algae. They kind of detect what was going on here about 490 million years ago. And I'm going to do this as quickly as possible, but it's a very important piece to realize that the mineral springs of Saratoga are incredibly different. They're special. They're highly mineralized. They're highly carbonated. And they're cold water. And that in itself is real tough. If you remember back to your basic chemistry classes, uh, you'll realize that one of the best ways to introduce things into solution or get them to dissolve is to heat them up. If we were to go to Old Faithful today out in Wyoming, um, that is a hot spring geyser that's at boiling point. And it has tremendous amounts of mineral content to it. But it's boiling water. Now, our water is going to come out of the ground. It's going to come out of the, the um, rock truck, which we're going to see here, at about 52 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit year round. And being cold, it's a, a real mystery to how do they dissolve so many minerals into our waters. And then the next question is, where do the minerals come from? The rocks that are on top of Saratoga are predominantly sedimentary, which means they were made in an ocean environment. Oceans are traditionally collecting basins. Everything runs off of the land and ends up in the ocean. And there's sea life there and, of course, runoff from the land. And so almost every possible element is going to be found in that ocean environment. If those rocks are made in that ocean environment, those rocks will trap those trace elements and the minerals in the rock so that millions of years later, when rainwater percolates down through our rock layers here in Saratoga, they will dissolve some of that uh, mineral content, some of the rock, and bring that dissolved mineral content in the water to the surface as it rises. And then, of course, our waters are very highly carbonated. So what a combination. I know many new people to the area do not like the taste of our mineral water. I understand that. But for the most part, if you don't like it, you hopefully can at least understand or appreciate they're special. They're very, very special. They're um, on the top tier of all the waters in the world for the mineral content in carbon dioxide. Uh, Kelly, if we can do the next one. In order to get the water to the surface, it's going to percolate down and then also come back up later on after it's gone through the rock structure. There had to be an initial crack in the rock. The Mohawk and other tribes in this area did not have the technology to drill. So this is a picture of the fault that lies behind uh, High Rock Park near the 9-11 Memorial near the uh, farmer's market. And on the top of this property, on the, the uppermost part of it, Today, we would find the old Brian Inn. This crack runs through Saratoga and allows the water to come to the surface on its own. And that's how we had a few, just a handful of mineral springs in the early days. And they were natural. Once the European settlers came, all of a sudden, with that technology, we went from a handful of four until by 1908, we had about 203 mineral springs. Like I always like to, to joke, <laughs> Americans are famous for if a little is good, I bet a lot's going to be a lot better. And in this case, it was too many. But um, it all started with this fault. Now, this fault is what's going to make Broadway. Every time you're shopping, walking, uh, visiting Broadway in Saratoga Springs, you're on the upthrown side of that fault. That's the part that got raised. The other part dropped. And all the springs are found on the east side of that fault. Fault runs through the middle of town, goes south to Baltston, gives them their mineral springs, and then it goes north, gives places like Gurn Springs and a few other places mineral springs, but more importantly, makes the mountains of Mount McGregor, West Mountain, Prospect Mountain, and eventually part of a system that made Lake George. Okay, Kelly, next one. Uh, here's an early depiction 
of the high rock. You notice the cone in the middle um, of the picture. Um, this was a naturally occurring spring, so the water would rise up to the surface there under the bright sunlight, especially in the summer, evaporation took place and the mineral content was left behind as the water evaporated. And you can also see depicted on the top of the fault line, it's one of the earliest uh, structures. Saratoga is kind of a unique place. We have an upper and a lower village that formed before 1800. And the upper village was around High Rock, the lower would form down around Congress Park. Okay, Kelly, next one. Here's another depiction of people visiting the spring. Again, um, there's inhabitants at the top, again, up near the old Bryan Inn. And um, Alexander Bryan ends up being the first full-time uh, settler to the city. Okay, Kelly, the next one, please. This is a picture, um, if you look to the uh, right side, lower right side, that um, boxed in area, uh, is supposed to be the Congress Spring. The Congress Spring was uh, discovered by Nicholas Gilman in 1792, and um, it bubbled out of the ground and it was determined that it was mineral water and named the Congress in um, uh, honor of the First Continental Congress, which uh, that gentleman served on. Uh, but in the background, you're going to see the early parts of Saratoga. Uh, the buildings on the left would be some of the early structures that were built by the Putnam family, their tavern and boarding house. And then almost right in the center of the picture is the picture of the um, Congress Hall that would be built by Gideon. Unfortunately, he would fall from the scaffolding on, during construction and then pass away on December 1st, 1812. But that's the way early Saratoga looked. And they built that fence around the Congress because livestock, they were free ro roaming and they would get in and, and drink and kind of contaminate the water. So it was an attempt to keep the purity of the Congress spring uh, at its highest amount. Okay, Kel. Uh, this is a picture of John Steele, Dr. John Steele. Um, he lived in Saratoga Springs um, in, a, in a nutshell. He did a lot of good things for Saratoga, but one of the most important in my estimation is he did some of the first mineral analysis of the springs. Others did it too, and they were published Columbia University and Harvard and places like that. But John Steele did a lot to uh, work with the chemistry of the waters to try to find what kind of effectiveness the water had on people. Okay, next one, please. Here's just some of that analysis that was done by him. Uh, again, in those early days, people were realizing, I think the Mohawk realized, that the waters had a, had a curing power, a healing power, and the whole thing was um, so exciting. It was like, well, what's in the water that's causing people to um, be cured of some of these more simple diseases? Okay, next one, please. And this is just a little closer look of all the breakdown um, that's in the waters. Now, um, I promise you I won't bore you any more than I have. I'll try to move on quicker. But the amount of mineral content that was found in the waters is, is phenomenal. I made a uh, uh, I think it's a composite list. I'll read it very quickly. In the mineral waters of Saratoga Springs dissolved are the minerals uh, boron, bromine, chromine, cobalt, copper, gallium, iron, lithium, magnesium, molybdenum, nickel, lead, a little bit of radium, strontium, tin, gallium, zinc, and zirconium. Uh, huge amounts of materials, but all in very small amounts. And you can well imagine if somebody had imbalances in their diet in the 1800s, um, if they needed iron or iodine and the waters contained it, it probably had some kind of efficacy um, for those early settlers. Okay, next one, please, Cal. Um, this is John Clark. John Clark came to Saratoga around 1823 and was very instrumental. I will have to set some uh, foundation for him. Um, in June of 1812, Gideon Putnam published a short list of uh, rules for the springs. He very strongly felt, Gideon did, that the water should always be free at the spring and it shouldn't be paid for so that if people needed the waters uh, for their health, they shouldn't have to pay for their health. So there was a lot of movement uh, on where should they position them and the fact that should people really own them, etc. Well, in the early days, people did own the springs. And when they did, 
they um, really under pressure. There was never a law passed, but they were under public pressure not to charge at the spring. And when um, uh, John Clark came to Saratoga, he had uh, come up from New York City. He made quite a bit of money on soda fountains. So he knew how to contain water, bottle it, market it, etc. And he eventually bought the property that would be around um, the present day Congress Spring and Columbian Spring and a, a good portion of Congress Park. And um, he purchased that and began to work with it and finally built a cover over it, bottled um, huge amounts of the water and really sent those bottles all around the world. Some of them were shipped as far away as China and they became our calling card. They were a very effective way to market Saratoga's existence and the fame of our waters. Count another one. Uh, here's just a quick view of, there were bottling plants near almost all of the springs, because if you go back and think of a business model on this, it's pretty clear. Um, if you can't charge for the water at the spring that you own, and you're gonna maintain a cover, pay taxes, clean it up, et cetera, uh, how do you make money? So bottling was one of the best ways and to sell it at, at a pretty hefty price all around the United States and around the world, and also to offer baths. Okay, Kel. Um, here's the Pavilion Hotel in Saratoga. Uh, as we were starting to get into the 1920s and 30s, um, Saratoga is starting to bloom and blossom, and it's all because of the vision of Gideon Putnam. Um, he basically, if he was alive today, he would have bought into the idea, if you build it, they'll come. He built the first hotel, and the idea was people would come here in the summer seeking the waters, and if they had good accommodations, etc., they'd stay. And that eventually evolved into we became the number one tourist destination in the United States in the 1800s, all resting initially on our waters. As Jamie will point out in a little while, uh, we're going to enhance that because as I always say, Americans can only be healthy for so long, so they had to have some fun, and we built a racetrack and casinos and other things. So, Kelly, next thing, please. Uh, this is um, a picture of the Pavilion Spring um, that is on the property that today is the Pavilion Hotel, which is uh, at the base of Lake Avenue. Um, that, um, it, it's got a checkered past. Um, Took a lot of money. Uh, a gentleman by the name of McLaren did a lot of work on that and spent a lot of money to bring the waters back and eventually had this beautiful ornate cover built around it. When he did, uh, <laughs> he was presented with a bill from the contractor and felt that the only way he could recoup that was to charge uh, for people to drink at his spring. He did, and I recently wrote an article on it. It's always kind of joked around in Saratoga history as the Stamp Act of Saratoga. Once he violated that sacred rule of charging for water at the spring, uh, there were some mysterious fires that occurred and things like that. And eventually he quickly dropped uh, the price tag for the drinking of the waters. Yeah. Uh, this is a picture of the Seltzer Spring on the left and the High Rock in the middle. Um, the High Rock at this point has evolved into a very ornate, beautiful uh, structure. And the Seltzer um, Spring, which is to the left, is supplying people with water being bottled heavily. Now, it was um, a mineral content. It's kind of funny. You can see that it's a short uh, distance between those two springs, but the content of the water was very, very different. The Seltzer had lower mineral content and was actually very good for mixing with certain alcoholic drinks, which the others weren't because of the mineral content. That became very famous. And it was it was piggybacking on the famous mineral spring the seltzer that was in Baden-Baden, Germany. So again, we kind of piggybacked on known items in the, in the day. Hey, Kel. Uh, close up of the High Rock, with that beautiful eagle on the top. Um, High Rock, Congress, so many of them were just um, magnetic in terms of attracting people. And because each had their own special taste, people did develop taste. And I always kind of joke, it's kind of like Pepsi and Coke. Um, people like one, maybe not the other. And our mineral springs were definitely that way. To have so many and to have all of them be roughly different in taste and, and certain qualities was kind of unique. And it really did help the market. Hey, Kelly. 
Um, Pepper Boy pictured here at the High Rock. You can see the cone. That cone is still there today in High Rock Park. Um, in order to facilitate um, getting the water out to more people, um, he had a small dipper wand, which we have a couple of them at the History Museum. And he would dip four glasses all at once, filling all four, and then distribute them to people. This was done at many of the springs. Most of them in the early days did not have spigots. They had boxed in areas. They were square boxed areas where the water would come up and it was easier to dip in that box and trying to have people scoop it out individually. Uh, dipper boys and girls were never paid. They were usually just allowed to keep their tips. They made quite a bet on that. Next one, Kelly. Um, this is uh, the back of the High Rock bathhouse. This was directly across from the High Rock Spring and just shows again the amount of uh, money that could be made. All of those, <laughs> all of those uh, towels and sheets were all um, on the clothesline each and every day so that they would be fresh and clean for the visitors that came the next day to take the baths. And there were so many baths in Saratoga. Um, eventually migrating, most of the big bathhouses went to the Spa State Park. And by the 1960s and 70s, they were waning in use and have ended up getting a, a little bit different uh, face to them. But uh, this one was for the High Rock and was supplied by High Rock Spring Water. Okay, next one, please. This is the old Red Spring. If you think about it, uh, it looks very similar not perfect, but very similar the way it sits. The old red on the corner. The old red was always known, and even as I was growing up, to be great for skin and eye ailments. Um, there's a, a phenomenal amount of magnesium, iron, and believe it or not, recently isolated quite a bit of zinc in it, which uh, when Dave and I did a group of research ophthalmologists years ago, we had communications after they left Saratoga, and their research shows that zinc is very helpful in uh, cutting down on cataract formation and things like that. So the waters were used heavily, and this shows spring in the front and uh, the bathhouse that existed in the back. Okay, next one. Okay, this is the Washington Spring. Uh, the Washington Spring um, was on Broadway, south of the Visitor Center, but north of... Uh, Depending on how long you've been in Saratoga, St. Peter's Academy or Saratoga Catholic School and um, the uh, Clarendon Hotel sat in that property. And this was in the back area. Um, believe it or not, this spring was found in 1806 by Gideon and a bathhouse was added in 1828. And then it um, was bought by John White, who was a stepson of uh, our good friend, um, John Clark, we saw a few minutes ago. And because bottling was in that family, they started bottling this one in 1859. Okay, next one, please. This is the Columbia. Um, the cover that's there today and the entrance to Congress Park looks very similar, a little um, smaller scale down to it. But um, that Columbian Hotel was, uh, or excuse me, that Columbian Spring was discovered 1803 by Gideon Putnam. He tubed it which meant he just got the water to the surface in a respectable way in 1806. And then um, the city tried to bring it back. And in 1981, there was quite a effort to bring it back and they found that it just wouldn't work. So today, if you were to visit there, the sign depicts very accurately it's city water that flows from that. Okay, next one. This is a picture of the park. You've got um, uh, the Congress and the Columbia and um, uh, that would be Congress Hall in the back. Just kind of helps to depict a picture of people and their day. Most travel guides suggested that when you arrived in Saratoga and checked into one of the large hotels, you would start out um, early in the morning, um, leaving your hotel room before breakfast and head to hugely the Congress Spring, although you might have had another one that you really liked. And you would drink actually two glasses followed by a brisk walk. Uh, now, Dave and I used to always kind of laugh about the fact that because of the magnesium content, if you weren't used to it, it kind of resembles the chemistry of a colonoscopy prep. So as a result, 
Um, it would um, make people probably go for a brisk walk to the nearest bathroom. And then after that, all of the um, um, guides would say, the rest of your day was yours. You had uh, had seen and been basing at the uh, springs. So the credibility of coming to Saratoga was there. You were there for the health and the waters. But you could drink heavily later or go gamble or whatever. And, um, you know, always dress and saunter around and talk and gossip on the hotels and hotel porticos and, and um, piazzas. So it, it was quite a summer scene in Saratoga, but it usually always started in the morning with the waters. Okay, next one, please. Uh, this is Deer Park Spring. Deer Park, believe it or not, originally in the 1800s was a pure uh, water spring. And right now, it's um, Department of Public Works has done a great job with this. They they read this about a year ago, and um, they've brought a supply of mineral water into it. Now, it has a little bit of an iron content, but it just shows you, again, with the way Congress Park looked and the number of visitors that were constantly hitting our springs. Next one, please. Congress Spring, 1876, in anticipation of the centennial of the United States, beginning of the spirit of 1776 this is how beautiful the congress spring looked okay next one please yeah, this is an inside view you can see the stained glass and behind that small bar was one of the dipper boys again it was the same procedure i talked about earlier the waters were dispensed by the dipper boy and again chances are at the end of supplying a group he or she, uh, young girls did it too, they probably got a, a tip of a penny. But if you think about the buying power in the day, if they left each day with anywhere from 50 to 100 pennies, it wasn't a bad income for somebody their age. Next one, please. This one um, is a uh, picture of um, the uh, carbonic sales. So we're getting to a dark kind of a dark side of Saratoga now. I alluded earlier to this, and I'll try to make it really quick. Um, America started to embrace the fact that there was so much water here, let's just keep taking it out. By the time we get to the 1880s, 1890s, uh, soda fountains are taken off in the United States. The need for carbonated water is extensive. You need a tremendous amount. Now, you can do that chemically with reagents. Of course, there's a cost to those chemicals in order to produce the carbon dioxide in the laboratory, especially after they found that our waters were naturally carbonated. So they started to drill massive numbers of springs down in the area of the present day Spa State Park. The geology is very simple. The, the fault line runs through there. It's kind of buried. You just have to do some test wells, but eventually they drilled carbonic, drilled about 47 wells all with the purpose that they would pull out the water, they would put it in large silos, they would allow the water to separate and capture the carbon dioxide in metal containers in tanks and then chip it off to urban areas so it could be used in soda fountains. The water was then dumped and the same process was repeated. Millions and millions of gallons of water were dropping down our water table in Saratoga Springs. So a series of legislative moves were made that we'll talk about in a minute. But the, that land that was finally confiscated is what's going to give us eventually today's state park. Spa State Park was original land owned by Carbonic. Okay, next one, please, Kelly. Okay, um, again, this is all the same down in that area, the Lincoln Baths and all of that area very heavily used, um, and no offense, well, by, at least by carbonic and being abused. Jamie, any comments you'd like to make on as we get into this part of it? Um, let's see. One, well, one thing about this building, because it does, con it, sometimes it does confuse people, is that this was the first um, Lincoln Bath building also, and this did burn down. So the one that's there now was, is, was built um, by the uh, by the state, so that as you can tell by the architecture of it. But yeah, so this is definitely the first one. Um, and what did, do you want to go to the next slide, Charlie? Yes. All right, and then I'll. Uh, that's the drink hall that um, 
right down near Ben and Jerry's. It's where uh, it's the property right now where our one of our parking garages sit on the corner of Putnam and Spring Street. And um, if we go to the next picture, Kelly, uh, this is an interior picture. Again, I want to drive home this idea of halter. You were bottling the waters, you were drinking the waters at the site, and then eventually, just like what we do today, how many times do we say, let's meet for coffee, or let's have a talk on a particular topic, and a neutral site to do that is at a Starbucks or a Dunkin' Donuts or even a Stewart's, and coffee seems to kind of be the uh, exchange of the day, but in the day, people flock to, to drink halls, and this one... Um, was the, the Hathorne Drink Hall and the waters of the Hathorne Spring, which were found when they were building um, the um, hotel ballroom for the Congress Hall. Um, they were discovered and uh, used extensively. And so people were doing that. And it, take a step back. One of our um, sponsors in this series is uh, the Visitor Center. It, it's... Um, the Convention and Tourism Visitor and the Visitor Center. And the Visitor Center was used as a drink hall. How many times do you find people that have been in Saratoga for a very long time refer to that building still as the drink hall, where you could go and sample the different waters that were coming out of Spa State Park. Okay, next one, please. Um, this is uh, j just a picture, again, of that bottling process. Depending on uh, where you were, um, in which spring and what their operation was. Most of the time, the water would rise up in a large um, boxed-in area like depicted here, and then you can see in the background the bottles. They were hand-bottled. In other words, they were hand-filled, and a cork was placed in, and a cover or basket was put on the top, just like champagne. They were under a lot of pressure, so they were thick-walled. They were usually dark-colored. And um, they had embossed lettering on them, which would say Saratoga Springs, New York, in the name of the spring. And we were putting out some years, 8 million hand-blown bottles a year filled with the mineral water of Saratoga. And like I said earlier, it went everywhere. What a calling card. 8 million bottles for, out of a little place like Saratoga Springs. Next one. Jamie, you want to do anti-pumping act? Sure. Or you want me to continue? Up I'll, to you. Sure, I'll, I'll happily do that. So, um. Okay. So the Anti-Pumping Act of 18 or of 1908 was established to protect um, the mineral springs. And the two major proponents of it from Saratoga were Spencer Trask, who you see on the left, and on the right is Edgar Truman Brackett. Um, this um, precipitate or was the beginning of us of the of the state of New York taking over the mineral springs and essentially saving them. So as Charlie said earlier, we had what 203 springs at the height of the Victorian era. After the pump, or after the pumping act was established, and the state took many of the springs by eminent domain, they capped off many of them, leaving only a few dozen that were left um, flowing in Saratoga Springs. And also remember that many of the springs were not nat or weren't natural; they were drilled. So, say we had two or three dozen natural springs, the remainders were ones that folks had just uh, purchased the land, drilled, hit hit spring water, and then you know pocketed their pocketed their pockets with bottling um, mineral springs. Next slide. Uh, this is a picture of the Seltzer Spring. You can see in the background the High Rock Spring. Uh, the cover that was built in 1908 is depicted here. Um, today we would have the 9-11 Memorial closer to the um, fault line. And of course the old Bryan Inn and area is up at the top. Um, this was a common practice in the latter part of the 1800s, early 1900s, was there was a movement to build up gas pressure. They would lower the spring. So the seltzer in this picture is now where the people are standing. And the thought was that it would build up a little bit more pressure and you would get a faster flow out of it. None of these are, were on pump assist. We have 17 springs at pump now, and the city has put a pump assist, an electric submerged pump on each one of them to have a constant flow rate. But in the original plant, it was coming up on its own gas pressure. And sometimes that gas pressure would alter a bit. So they went to lower levels to build up pressure. Unfortunately, you can well imagine what happens when you get a heavy rain. Mm -hmm. You get a heavy rain, the water's going to go right to the 
lowest point and it would contaminate the wells. Sometimes they had to be sanitized in order for people to safely drink them. So that's why you don't see that protection or that design work anymore because it just wasn't worth it. Okay, next one, please. So this is where we veer away. We go away from Mineral Springs and now I play the part of Dave Patterson because Dave, <laughs> Dave always says, I don't like the mineral water. Nobody wants to drink that stuff. But um, so I, I wish Dave was watching this, but um, yeah. so people came um, to Saratoga for the mineral water originally, but they needed things to do. And gambling did start in Saratoga Springs and in horse racing well, well before the time of John Morrissey. But the gambling were generally small local gambling houses and racing was harness racing. Um, I'm not going to go into Morrissey's full background because I think many of the folks on this probably know that. Um, but Morrissey truly um, put Saratoga Springs on the international map for attracting um, not just folks that had to come here for medicinal purposes, but really to um, to play. So, um, as you know, he was a um, Morrissey was a congressman. He was a at one time he was a Tammany Hall stooge. Um, he headed the Dead Rabbit Gang in New York City, and he really, he built himself up. He was an immigrant with no money. Um, eventually, becomes a very wealthy individual, but never really accepted into high Victorian society. But when he, so he comes to Saratoga Springs in the 1860s, starts the race course, um, but also knew that there were other ways to make money. Um, when he was in New York, he ran the Golden Door, which was one of Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt's gambling establishments. Um, so Morrissey um, had a knack for that, uh, for gambling. So next slide, please. So he um, buys a, a tract of land in what is today Congress Park. So I like this engraving out of the collection um, for a couple of reasons. One, um, it really demonstrates what people were doing. It says, uh, if you can read that, it says, on the road to the race course, Congress Street. Well, Morrissey um, purchased this small piece of land at the corner of Putnam Street and, and East Congress Street, as it was called, and built um, his Saratoga Clubhouse. He bought this in 1867. 1870 is when the building opens up. So that makes this year the 150th anniversary of us um, having uh, the Saratoga Clubhouse at the Canfield Casino. So in this, it's really depicting folks going up to watch the races. And, they're, and if they're going to go um, to the track, the main road was um, East Congress Street that went up to Union Avenue and straight to the racetrack. So why not build his, a gambling establishment here? Um, because everybody is going to pass it on the way and on the way back. Next slide, please. And this slide really complements um, that engraving. Um, and well, the way I'm doing this is I'm kind of showing you guys more of an architectural and building history of the casino. So this image, this dates to um, definitely um, either late John Morrissey or Spencer and Reed time. I'm pretty certain it's John Morrissey. Um, how, do you, how do you know that? Well, look at the side of the building. Um, there's no stained glass window um, where, our, where the museum gift shop is today which would be just to the right of um, the door to the left. And that door is the one we call the Mary Lou Whitney entrance. Um, you see there's no large um, building on the back, which is the uh, dining room that we have today that Richard Canfield had constructed, but you do see a small building off the back. That actually was John Morrissey's dining room. And there is a shot of an interior of that, which we'll show in just a little bit. One thing that's kind of confusing about this, um, oh, can you go back? Um, if you look to the left, uh, you see the Morrissey Fountain, which is still in its original position today. And then you see another building. Well, Putnam Street um, came all the way through Congress Park, basically where the ponds are outside of the casino. Though that Those are man-made. Um, Village Brook um, did, uh, was diverted underneath Congress Park. Um, so this was all, um, it was all dry land at that point. And these buildings went right down along Putnam Street. Um, they were owned by Morrissey. They were called the Saratoga Asso Racing Association Rooms. And um, at least one of them was called the Pool Room. And it's not where you're going to go in and shoot pool. It was a betting pool room for the racetrack. Um, so, yeah, let's go to the next one, please. So this is an interior, um, an interior shot of the gambling parlor. Um, it's one of the only um, images of the gambling parlor that we have. You don't see any individuals in here, obviously, because if this place operated illegally and gambling was illegal in Saratoga Springs, even though it went on way out in the open, everybody knew it. Um, 
it attracted the wealthiest players in the world. So Morrissey was able to um, operate. What I like about this is as you look around the room, you see the roulette wheels um, and you can see some, uh, m m many of the original chairs that are still in the casino. And that also that original carpeting, that carpet when it was put down was said to have been the largest seamless carpet in the world at that time. And came from um, Scotland, came to, uh, when it came up the Hudson River on a boat, from there it was transferred to a railroad car to Saratoga Springs. And they say they, rumor has it anyway, that they had built a special car just to get it in a um, railroad car that would accommodate the size of that to get it up to Saratoga Springs. Um, the center of the room in this drawing and also in other um, engravings that we've seen is kept open. And that's because the center of the room was for conducting business. Um, there's the people that were coming into play in here, they had to buy, purchase a, a membership for the summer. It was only in July and August. No local Saratoga Springs residents were permitted in to gamble, because if it's it's illegal, the last thing you want is someone lo who lives local to lose money in your legal establishment. Then you know, then people actually might have to do something about your your gambling. Morrissey had very little trouble during his time, very little trouble with anybody um, giving him an issue about uh, about gambling. Um, this image is probably, and I'm, I'm going to say it's probably 1890s before. Um, Canfield did a lot of the additions to the building. And I'm going to say that because if you look at the two large chandeliers that are hanging in there, the two that are still there today, you can see what looks like strings coming down, holding them up. Those aren't strings. Those are some of the original electric light cords that were that were run in. Um, the electricity was not run through it like it is today. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is not a very clear image. This is um, it's a very rare image. There's only a couple copies of this. Um, one is um, in the Jokey collection at the Saratoga Room. There's one that I found on eBay that I got outbid on um, a number of years ago. And this was um, given to the museum in like 96 or 97. It's a photocopy, but by Bob Jokey. And this is the dining room, Morrissey's dining room that is no longer exists in the back of the casino. Um, you can see, and Bob, when I, I talked to him about it and he told me, he thinks that the gentleman that's standing on the left is John Morrissey. It's really hard to tell, um, but you can see that he's got his wait staff standing around all the tables. Um, the light fixtures match the fixtures in the rest of the building. And the chairs that are around that table are the chairs that are in our hikes, I, at least it's um, a part of the set, that are in the high stakes room today that all bear the JM John Morrissey monogram on them. Um, so it's nothing like the dining room we have in there today. It was small, intimate, um, which is probably the way that uh, Morrissey ran um, ran the casino. It was. I don't think you would have seen hundreds of people in there gambling at once, especially not in the upstairs rooms. But in the in the major parlor, maybe if you had twenty or thirty gamblers in, that would have been busy. And then this small room is set for their dinner. And we do have sections of that carpet that the gentlemen are standing on, also in the museum collection. Next slide, please. So Morrissey operated the building until he passed away in 1878. Um, two of his racing association um, associates, Albert Spencer and Charles Reed, entered into partnership and um, took over the casino. Um, the T New York Times had written that Spencer and Reed allowed the building to fall into disrepair. Um, they said the lavishness of the casino was gone, the walls were whitewashed, um, and the, they lowered the standards where more people, not just um, high society, could come in to gamble. Next slide, please. And this is an image that we just acquired a couple of years ago. Um, and it's dated 1888. Um, we, from, and we know from all the other images that it came in with um, and who the photographer was. So... You see the side of the building. You can see the Morrissey fountain. Um, you can actually see the, the iron basket on top of the fountain if you look closely. So it, it, it was always said that if casino gambling was open or the casino was open for gambling, there would be a red ball that balanced, balanced on top of the Morrissey fountain. And we always said that was ridiculous. How could that happen? Now that we see that there was a basket on there, we know that they could have put a red ball up in there. And actually, when DPW restored um, the fountain a couple of years ago, you know, I had talked to Commissioner Scirocco and Basically, I said, come on, you got to recreate this basket and put it on top. And he said, do you know how um, how many pieces of paper and soda cans and junk will be taken out of there every morning? And I'm like, you know, I never thought of that. I'm just thinking it as a historian. And he's right. It would have been a it would have been a nightmare. 
But one thing, it's there's two things neat about this. So this is the Mary Lou Whit Whitney entrance. Um, and the sign above it um, says, Ladies and Gentlemen's Restaurant. Um, so the um, Spencer and Reed were opening it up to more people. And up, up, up above on the second floor, um, to the second window in, um, if you look, you can see a face in there. Then you go two more windows over and you see another gentleman in that window. Um, I've scanned this at a very high resolution and blown it up. And that was, that's Spencer and Reed standing in there. So as owners of the casino, they were having their photograph taken, um, which is absolutely, I find really, uh, really interesting. Now, these guys um, had another partner, um, Richard Canfield. And Canfield ends up buying them out, um, or actually buying Albert Spencer off the last, his, as Reed um, disappeared. Um, buying them out, and then he becomes the sole owner of the casino. Next slide, please. And say um, Canfield, also he was, I, I want to say, I don't want to say similar to Morrissey, but he um, was self-made, um, self-educated, um, and a gambler for a number of years, spent time in jail. Um, I believe it was, it was before he um, operated our casino. And while he was in there, he really taught himself um, or become essentially an art historian. And he was a lover of art. When Canfield owned the casino, um, you would have seen Hudson River Valley um, or Hudson River school paintings all through the casino and actually Whistler paintings. Um, Canfield and Whistler were very good friends. And the last painting that Whistler did was of Richard Canfield. Um, Whistler had a very, or excuse me, Canfield had a large Whistler collection. And in the summers, he displayed them in the casino. Next slide, please. And some of the paintings um, that we see in here, these could be, um, these could be his Whistlers. So this room is what is now our orientation room and gift shop. Um, we know we can date this pre-1902, because you don't, this Tiffany stained glass window is still not in here. It would be on the right hand wall. And those two windows that you're looking at there um, no longer exist. So that's where the stained glass window um, is. If you, um, this, this room was called the library and reading room. So club members could come in here, um, meet with um, Canfield. Club members could change their chips here. Or if you weren't a member and you were gonna wait and meet somebody, this is where you would stay. Um, behind that partition that you see um, in the back, that's where um, Morrissey's desk and safe and Canfield's desk and safe were kept. Um, and it, the safe that they always said there was a million dollars on hand in there. Um, that partition has had a couple, um, lived in a couple different areas. That is where it, um, where Canfield had it. Originally when Morrissey had the building, it was down at this, at the far end of, of the room. So actually you could have come in from the, Mary Lou Whitney door. And today there's a wall there. That would have been that partition actually. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. So 1902, 1903 is when Canfield um, begins major additions and expansions of the casino. Um, and it's not, you know, in my, this is some of this is my personal opinion, but it's not just because Canfield wanted to beautify and make more money. Canfield is making an attempt to buy public favor. There was anti-gambling pressure. No, oh, sorry about that. My wife will grab that. There is anti-gambling pressure um, in um, Saratoga Springs. Canfield decides he's going to try to make some changes. So he adds this beautiful dining room that we're all familiar with today. Um, if you saw this photo, um, if this photo was colorized, you'd almost think this was on um, their setting up for a wedding in the casino. But many of the, uh, uh the tables are gone, but many of these chairs that you see are still in the museum, are in the building, in the museum collection that we have upstairs, and some of them in storage. Um, Canfield's idea was that you make this very high-end restaurant. You allow anybody to come into the restaurant, but um, it's still um, quite exclusive. And there's legend and lore that go along with it, like the story of our trout pond that's behind the casino, where we'd say that the chef would come out of the kitchen, take you out to the pond. He nets, he nets your trout that you select. You bring it back in with great fanfare. And then um, his sous chef somehow gets the fish back in the pond and you get something he already prepared. Is it true? Um, I know there's no, there, there's no sluice way that's, um, that you could put a trout in that would go back out to the pond, like we like to say. But it's kind of cool that we've got these neat Saratoga Springs legends. Um, all the windows up on the um, ceiling, those are stained glass windows. And they were backlit in the 19th century. 
or um, by Canf or 1902 by Canfield. And today they've been, um, the lighting has been replaced um, with modern lighting that's um, more effective, it's safe. Um, if you saw the lights that were up there, you would say, wow, it's amazing that um, the place survived when it did. And those windows had been removed in, um, I believe it was somewhere in the 1950s. And then when the building was, um, but we don't know who removed them. They just sort of disappeared. But in the, in the 1980s, when restoration was occurring in the building, they somehow just reappeared and were reinstalled. Some of them have been um, reconstructed, but most are truly original. And one thing about this building, just as you look up and you see all the um, architecture on the ceiling that looks like they are, um, that they're um, separate pieces of, um, of wood that are placed in, that is all plaster molding everywhere in the building. It's all plaster. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. Um, if you saw off the end of each, uh, off the end of the building, there is what looked like um, small cupolas. Well, these are private dining areas that Canfield um, had. There were two on each end of the dining room. Those are gone today. But if we, uh, in the next slide, please, you can see it from the outside. Oh, and I went in the wrong order, that's okay. Um, I just wanna note that uh, this is a photo, not, this isn't bolster collection, this is one of the ones in the archive of the museum. They're at, we're out at the Italian gardens. You can see spit and, uh, the water from spit and spat. The man on the right is Richard Canfield. The man on the left is Pat McDonald, and I do believe that the man in center is um, ben million, John Benamillion Gates. And Gates is one of um, Canfield's favorite customers at the, at the casino because he basically lost hundreds of thousands of dollars many times in, in the high stakes room of the casino. Um, and it's a rare image of these three gentlemen together. Next one, please. Yeah, this is, this is the one I just wanted to show you. So if you look at um, this um, West, Western side view of the casino, you can, this is what it would look like to almost look like today if you're looking at it. You can see the Morrissey Fountain, and right from there is the Tiffany stained glass window that's in the um, orientation room today. And to the left, there's the Mary Lou Whitney entrance, and then you see the massive dining room that Canfield had. And right there, you can see the two um, private dining areas that stand out into Congress Park. And on the, all the way on the back, um, which today is where DPW, or Department of Public Works, has... Um, their offices, that is, that was the pantry for the casino. I believe that those um, cupolas or the dining rooms were removed somewhere in the 50s or 60s. And today that's where the, um, uh, there's a ramp that goes up into the city offices and um, placed in that area. And this is, this photo right here dates to right around 1929, 1930. Um, and this is after Saratoga, the city of Saratoga Springs had um, acquired the casino from Richard Canfield. Um, they purchased it from him in 1906 as he had shut down the casino for gambling. And following the purchase, that's when the, uh, the city also took Congress Hall for taxes and really created Congress Park. Took uh, Putnam Street, no longer ran through the park. Um, East Congress Street was blocked off, so you couldn't um, cross Circular Street and continue on Union Avenue. And Village Brook was um, channeled um, was, well, which was channeled underground, was diverted so that the man-made ponds could be filled or um, emptied at the will of, um, of the city whenever, whenever they needed to be. And it created our downtown parkland. Next slide, please. And with that, that is the last slide that um, Charlie and I had to talk about um, these, uh, these two aspects of Saratoga Springs history. Um, just want to note that, so the museum, we are in the Canfield Casino. Um, we are closed uh, for uh, for the season. We're going to reopen in the spring. You know, I like to say March 1st, um, might be April 1st, it might be May 1st, but it just depends on um, when we're permitted to open. But our goal is March 1st. Um, and then we'll be, if we, when we reopened, um, it'll be probably a couple days a week. And then for the summer, we're going to be shooting for seven days a week again, um, 10 to four. And we want to we wanna welcome people back into the Canfield Casino. So thank you all very much for, um, for listening to us today and letting Charlie and I talk about our two favorite um, aspects of Saratoga Springs history. <laughs>